Uh, so I'm delighted this afternoon to welcome and introduce our, our first speaker, Charles M. Blow. Um, Charles M. Blow is an op-ed columnist <laughs> at the New York Times, where his column appears on Mondays and Thursdays. Mr. Blow's columns tackle not hot-button issues such as social justice, racial equality, presidential politics, police violence, gun control, and the Black Lives Matter movement, among many other topics. Uh, Mr. Blow is also a CNN comment commentator and was a presidential visiting professor at Yale, where he taught a seminar on media and politics. He is also the author of the critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller selling memoir, Fire Shut Up in My Bones. Um, the book won a Lambda Literary Award and the Spur Sperber Prize and made multiple prominent lists of best books published in 2014. People Magazine called it searing and unforgettable. His second book, The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto, was named a most anticipated book by the San Francisco Chronicle, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, Time Out, Time and Country, and Lithop. The bio course continues, but I would prefer for us to hear for ourselves why Charles Blow is such a sought after a speaker. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Mr. Charles Blow. Thank you. I, I'm actually coming back to Detroit. I used to live in Detroit. I think I moved in uh, 94. Um, so I'm home. Um, <laughs> so injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Now this is one of Dr. Martin Luther King's most famous quotes. But what many of you may not know is that he spoke those words right here in Detroit at Cobb Hall in front of a massive crowd of 25,000 people. The gathering was called the Great March on Detroit, and it was a precursor to the March on Washington, which would come about two months later. In fact, in his Detroit speech, King used some of the same I have a dream of phrasing that he would later use in Washington. But King used his line about injustice more than once and with slightly different emphases. Two weeks before he spoke in Detroit, his letters from a Birmingham jail had been published in which he spoke about the universal repercussions of injustice. King wrote, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what's happening in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. But here in Detroit, King narrowed his focus. He attempted to erase the somewhat artificial and in many cases exaggerated concept of racism being a mostly Southern phenomenon. As King concluded in his Detroit speech, he said, hypothetically, you're asking, I'm sure, what can we do here in Detroit to help in the struggle in the South? One of the things King advised was this, what people here can do to help us down in Alabama, Mississippi, and all over the South is to work with determination to get rid of any segregation and determination in Detroit. Realizing that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. King concluded, we've got to come to see that the problem of racial injustice in, is a national problem. No community in this country can boast of clean hands in the area of brotherhood. Now, in the North is different in that it doesn't have the legal sanction that it has in the South, but it is subtle and hidden in its forms, and it exists in three areas, in the area of unemployment discrimination, in the area of housing discrimination, and in the area of de facto segregation in the public schools. And we must come to see that de facto segregation in the North is just as injurious as actual segregation in the South. King was saying delicately what, Ma what Malcolm X would say more bluntly a year later, also here in Detroit. If you are black, you were born in jail in the North as well as the South. 
Stop talking about the South. As long as you're south of the Canadian border, you're south. In America, now as then, there is no promised land of racial egalitarianism. There is no state or city in this country devoid of racism. In fact, I contend that racism is exacerbated not by which quadrant of the country you're in, but by concentration. There is a recurring theme in American history. In the abstract, when there are few blacks in northern cities, people there could look down their noses at the people in the racist in the south. But when the masses of black people showed up in these northern cities, those northerners employed many of the same brutal tactics, mob violence, oppressive policing, housing discrimination, restrictive employment that southern racists had used to keep black folks subordinate and separate. Northern so-called liberalism is marbled with contradictions. Take, for instance, the New York draft riots of 1863, exactly 100 years before King spoke here in Detroit. During the Civil War, which broke out in 1861, some New York politicians and newspapers engaged in a relentless campaign of fear-mongering to poor white New Yorkers claiming that when the war was over, throngs of newly freed black people were going to show up and take their jobs. When Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, it only intensified the paranoia. And then a conscription, conscription law for a draft was passed in 1863, a draft that omitted black men because of racism, because they were not considered to be citizens at the time. And so a five-day bloody riot erupted in which black people were often targeted. They even stormed and burned down an orphanage for black children. The published death toll of those riots was 119 people, although some speculate that the number could have been as large as 1,200 people. This violent reaction happened again after the Great Migration, which began around 1916. It was the movement of millions of black people, mostly from the rural south to cities in the north and west. Soon after they started to relocate it, and often in direct response to their arrivals, violent mobs of white people in cities around the country attacked black people, some of whom fought back valiantly, by the way. So much blood flowed in America's streets that year that James Weldon Johnson, who was then the field secretary of the NAACP, dubbed it the Red Summer. In 10 months, an estimated 250 people were killed in riots in at least 25 cities. Nearly 100 of them were lynched. And if you expand the definition of Red Summer to begin with the 1917 riots in St. Louis and end with the 1923 Rosewood Massacre in Florida, the toll comes to more than 1,100 deaths. This scenario plays out again on a smaller scale when King himself tries to push his battle for equality out of the South and into the North and West. After the Watts riots of 1965, King confessed in an essay written for the Saturday Review that the Civil Rights Movement had been a regional movement centering in the South with most of the benefit going to Black people in the South. He noted... In the North, on the other hand, the Negroes' repellent slum life was altered not for the better, but for the worse. Oppression in the ghettos intensified. Two homes of 10 years ago already squalid were added 10 years of decay. School segregation did not abate, but increased. Above all, unemployment for Negroes swelled and remained unaffected by general economic expansion. As the nation, white and Negro, trembled with outrage of police brutality in the South, police misconduct in the North was rationalized, tolerated, and usually denied. King committed himself to helping to remedy this. In 1966, he brought his fight for fair housing to Chicago. He moved himself into a third floor walk up in the North Lawndale neighborhood of that city. It was a two bedroom apartment that had a broken door and reeked of urine the day he moved in. But King would soon learn a lesson that shocked even him. That Northern racism was just as virulent and possibly more virulent than Southern racism. When they marched in the South, a few hundred racists and Klansmen might show up in opposition. When he marched in Chicago, 
thousands of white people, many of them violent, showed up in opposition. King was struck so hard in the head with a rock that it knocked him to the ground. King would later observe, I have been, seen many demonstrations in the South, but I have never seen anything so hostile and so hateful as I've seen here today. King's experience in the fair housing fight in Chicago deepened and complicated his understanding of the intransigence of American racism. King said in a 1968 interview when asked about his I Have a Dream speech that after much soul searching, he had come to see that, quote, some of the old optimism was a little superficial and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. That evolution towards a more solid realism, towards a more rational king, towards a more radical king, is why I happen to believe that one of King's most consequential speeches is a little-discussed speech he gave a year before in 1967 at Stanford University, and that speech is called The Other America. It remains relevant because it deals with the rigidity of America's racial caste system and America's racial tribalism. And it deals with the profound ways in which economic inequity is tied at the hip with racial inequity. The linking of these two concepts had been central to King's thinking about inequality all of his life. In a 1950 college paper, King wrote of racial and economic inequalities as inseparable twins. As King told his Stanford audience, he understood that the dismantling of legal segregation was in a way the easy part. It was the structural racism, not written in the law, but in the minds of men that was harder to change. In his speech, King blasted, quote, large segments of white society for being, quote, concern, more concerned with tranquility and status quo than with justice, equality, and humanity. He slammed what he called the white backlash for being the cause of discontent and shouts for black power that rather than the result of it, calling it merely a new name for an old phenomenon. He declared that true integration is, quote, not merely a romantic or aesthetic something where you merely add color to a still predominantly white power structure. This speech was delivered after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 65, and it was delivered while many of the very same supposedly liberal senators from the North and West who had voted for those acts were opposing the Fair Housing Act, which would not pass until after King was assassinated. King rightfully saw this as the North and West hypocrisy and vacillation on the question of true racial equality. Walter Mondale, who was a young senator from uh, Minnesota in the 1960s, seemed to agree, saying a lot of civil rights was about making the South behave, about taking the teeth out of George Wallace. Fair housing came right to the neighborhoods across the country. This was civil rights getting personal. He meant getting personal to white people in the North. Open housing wasn't about Southern racism. It was about all of America's racism. As King put in his Stanford speech, we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. It is much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote than it is to guarantee the right to live in a sanitary, decent housing condition. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine, quality, integrated education a reality. And so today we are struggling for something that says we demand genuine equality. It's not merely a struggle against extremist behavior towards Negroes. And I'm convinced that many of the very people who supported us in the struggle in the South are not willing to go all the way now. I came to see that this... I came to see this in a very difficult and painful way. In Chicago, the last year where I've lived and worked, some of the people who came quickly to march with us in Selma and Birmingham weren't active around to Chicago. I came to see that so many people who supported us morally, even financially, what we were doing in Birmingham and Selma were really outraged about the extremist behavior of Bull Connor and Jim, Tor Jim Clark towards 
Negroes, rather than believing in genuine equality for Negroes. This is another way of describing the unshakable persistence of white supremacy. You see, white supremacy is a concept that many try to only apply to the vocal violent racists. But in fact, it is much more broadly applicable, applicable and pervasive. People think that they can avoid the appellation because they do not openly hate. But hate is not a requirement of white supremacy. Just because you abhor violence and cruelty does not mean that you, are, you truly believe that all people are equal and culturally, intellectually, creatively, morally. Entertaining the notion of imbalance, that white people are inherently better than others in any way, is also white supremacy. The position of opposing racial cruelty operates pretty much the same way as opposing animal cruelty. People do it not because they deem the object of the cruelty to be their equal, but because they can't countenance the idea of someone, something innocent creature being abused. I say don't beat the dog, not because I think the dog is equal to me. <laughs> right? But even here, the comparison cleaves because suffering black people are judged to have courted their own suffering through a cascade of poor choices. This view that black people are not human at the same level as white people is what King called the thingification of the Negro. This soft white supremacy is the foundation on which evil, violent racism is built. And as King put it in his Stanford speech, in the final analysis, racism is evil because its ultimate logic is genocide. King linked the virulent racism of the South and the deceitful racism of the North in his condemnation. If one says that I am not good enough to live next door to him, if one says that I am not good enough to eat at a lunch counter or to have a good, decent job or to go to school with him merely because of my race, he is saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. Also, King understood that concentrated poverty is a direct result of structural inequality and that concentrated poverty is attended by hopelessness and desperation, all of which is a prime breeding ground for violence. And King understood that people didn't simply wake up one day with a burning desire to live in the poorest, most violent parts of their cities. <laughs> Generations of discriminatory housing and banking and, empl and employment practices created these areas. The slums and ghettos did not come to be by accident or as a result of lack of will or ambition. Very few things in America happen by accident. There are ghettos in America because America created those ghettos to segregate and geographically isolate particular people. We have concentrated poverty, not by chance, but by design. We must understand this. Nothing in America can be divorced from America. The whole of America as it came to exist or as it now exists, our present culture rests on a historical context. And as King put it in his Stanford speech, in 1863, the Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery. But at the same time, the nation refused to give him land to make that freedom meaningful. And at the same period, America was giving millions of acres of land in the West and Midwest, and that was by an act of Congress, by the way, which meant that America was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor that would make it possible to grow and develop and refuse to give that same economic floor to its black peasants. King continued. This is why Frederick Douglass could say that emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger, freedom to the winds and the rains of heaven, freedom without roofs to cover their heads. He went on to say that it was freedom without bread to eat, freedom without land to cultivate. It was freedom and famine at the same time. King went on to observe that America has been backlashing on the whole question of basic constitutional and God-given rights for Negroes and other disadvantaged groups for more than 300 years. 
It is these issues of economic oppression and economic allocation that inform racial inequality and that challenge America's commitment to equality. As King once put it, the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, quote, bargained race. King said of those acts, they didn't cost the nation anything. In fact, it helped the economic side of the nation to integrate lunch counters and public accommodations. It didn't cost the nation anything to get the right to vote established. And now we're confronted with issues that cannot be solved without costing the nation. King summarized, we can't get rid of slums and poverty without it costing the nation something. And when King spoke of true equality costing America, it is not about the cost of handouts or welfare, but about the cost of dismantling the architecture of white supremacy and radical uh, racial oppression that maintain inequality. See, King wasn't naively oblivious to structural racism and how it cloisters power and inhibits mobility and equality. He was acutely aware of it and adamantly opposed to it. It wasn't about victimization. It was about honest appraisal. Listen, most black people in America don't want America's prescriptions or its penances or its pity, and they never have. (laughs) Pity does not dismantle privilege. It supports it. Pity requires the perch. It rolls downhill. The only way you can pity me is you have a position that's higher than me. Pity reinforces imbalances of power. It can be a violence operating as a benevolence. And to this day, America, particularly those supposedly liberal cities in the North and West, are still profiting from oppression, bleeding money from black and brown flesh. It comes now by way of mass incarceration in private prisons. It comes by way of aggressive over-policing in black and brown neighborhoods that produces hundreds of millions of dollars in summons and fines and bail and prison fees. At the same time, this has the accompanying effect of leaving whole communities sucked dry of fathers and brothers and sons by mass incarceration. Hundreds of thousands of marriage-age black men simply vanished. Take Ferguson, for instance. This is where Mike Brown was killed. As Forbes reported at the time, an important but underreported indicator of Ferguson's dilemma is that half of the young African-American men are missing from the community. In other words, there are more than two young black women for each young black man in Ferguson. The magazine continued, while the problem of missing African-American men is especially severe in Ferguson, young black men are absent from most American cities. And then the New York Times followed up with a nationwide analysis and found that there were nearly 1.5 million missing black men between the ages of 25 and 54, and that 600,000 of those were missing due to higher incarceration rates. Think about that the next time you ask somebody, well, why, why are the young black women getting married? Well, the... <laughs> Aside from having a devastating cultural impact on these communities, it also devastates those communities economic, economically. This explosion of mass incarceration is what Michelle Alexander called the new Jim Crow, noting that more black men are now behind bars or under the watch of the criminal justice system than were enslaved in 1850, 11 years before the Civil War began. And even after the Civil War, when the 13th Amendment was passed and ratified in 1865, formally ending slavery, it read like this. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. This means that as long as you could be convicted, imprisoned, those people being disproportionately black and brown, you could still force 
people to provide free labor. Even in the recent outrage over police shootings of people of color, they, they are all rooted in the profit imperative of police officers already disproportionately deployed in black and brown neighborhoods, and they are pushed to increase their contacts and activity and write more summons and make more arrests. And with this increased activity, sometimes something eventually goes horribly wrong. And instead of focusing on the racist system that necessitated the interaction in the first place, we focus on the individual behaviors and biases involved by the two people. We must look at the institutions as well as, in it, as the individuals. As Mother Jones Magazine has put it, the mission of entire police departments has been shifted from protect and serve to punish and profit. Is it a coincidence that many of the recent cases involving black people killed by the police began with stops for minor offenses? It is not. This emphasis on profit has become a fiscal menace, the magazine called it. And in these police shootings, we don't focus enough on how many of these cases are clustered in northern and western cities. As Isabella Wilkinson, author of The Warmth of Other Sun, brilliantly observed in the New York Times, many of these controversial cases are in some of our most liberal cities, the very ones to which black people flock during the Great Migration. And these are many of the same cities that experienced race riots that occupied King in the late 1960s. In a way, the urban North and West have become and remain the new civil rights battleground. We must make these cities come to terms with the viciousness of their own brand of racism and its persistence. And we have to ask ourselves if we are willing enough and strong enough and brave enough to keep fighting for the full racial equality and economic justice that King ended his life fighting for. Are we willing, strong, brave enough to fight against white supremacy and what King called the thingification of the Negro? Are we willing, strong, brave enough to demand that America, all of America, fully and urgently commit to a world without racism rather than taking this half-hearted stroll of gradualism? Martin Luther King was assassinated on a Memphis motel balcony one year to the month after delivering his Stanford speech. He was in Memphis to support striking black sanitation workers who demanded a fair wage and fair working conditions. The day before his assassination, he delivered his mountaintop speech in which he challenged America to make its constitutional principles of freedom and equality fully inclusive of black people. He said, all we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. It is now up to us to make America be true to what it said on paper, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you very much. Charles has already been subjected to my sense of humor. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have uh, questions from you. Uh, there should be a slide coming up that'll indicate how you send your questions to us. You're essentially going to use a chat function on your phones. It's going to appear on this little screen that I have here. 
and I will read your questions as they come up. But while we're getting, oh, excuse me, while we're getting that all set up, I have a few questions of my own. <laughs> so, Charles, I was reading, I've been reading a lot about you of late, of course, and um, I was interested in this uh, quote I found in one of the articles where it just, it said that you do not call yourself an activist and do not admit to any political aspirations. It's starting his first newspaper in high school, I think he said, and he has thought of himself as a newspaper man uh, through and through. Um, your job, you write, is to bear witness. And you interpret the world and you record history in real time. So my question to you is, what are you thinking about the real time history that is being created as we speak? Well, that's too broad a question. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's because you can answer however you want. No, I mean, you know, the political climate, the divisiveness, the, um, the uh, you know, our lack of ability to really tell the truth, um, what we believe, who, who we believe, those kinds of issues that are coursing through our society right now. What do you, how do you see that in real time? Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to pretend that I'm a historian, right. but I, I guess I'm a, uh, student of history. Yeah. So I pay very close attention to historical parallels to whatever we're seeing now. I, I don't believe that many things are completely brand new in society or in humanity. Uh, and so I see a lot of parallels now to the creation of Jim Crow. I see a lot of parallels now to the panic uh, that, as I spoke about the draft riots in New York, the, the panic that poor, that was instilled in poor white people. It wasn't even that, that this was natural. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. political operatives uh, and the some of the elite in New York who depended on the slave trade 40% of the, the, the goods leaving New York harbors were cotton from the South, right? So they, they, had, they had gotten rid of slavery or outlaw slavery in 1808 or somewhere. Someone can give that the number right. Let me not say the, name, the, the year. But they had gotten rid of uh, slavery officially years ago, but there was still a healthy underground market for enslaved people in New York. And a lot of their profit, both banks, insurance companies, everybody, Manufacturers depended on their relationship to the South. In fact, when the Southern states uh, seceded, some people in New York thought maybe New York should secede too because they were so connected mm -hmm. right. to the South. And so I see that panic around economic anxiety. I see that panic around uh, white replacement I see that panic uh, around sharing space. A lot of that is, can you can say, is happening again, right? And so there, there are periods where you see the exact same thing happening that happened before, or you see this rash of voter suppression um, laws that went to effect after Biden won. Uh, and many of those, the people who, the states that went in first were the states that had seen the highest percentage growth of people who were not white. It was Arizona and Georgia, mm -hmm. right? And so, and the idea of people manipulating the electoral system so that they are, because they fear being outnumbered at the polls, that's exactly the reason we got Jim Crow. There were three southern states that were majority black. They were the first ones to establish Jim Crow. There's no, it's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence that Mississippi and South Carolina were the first two states to call constitutional conventions to, white, to write white supremacy into the codes of those states. That's because those were two of the three majority black states. And when they use enough terror to get enough of the control to call the convention and to exclude the black people, by the way. There was one black delegate in Mississippi at the Constitutional Convention that they allowed to come. 
in a majority black state. And it was that delegate who believing that he could placate white people, white racists, who advocated for the reading, the literacy test. Because he thought, he, and he gave it a speech. He's like, I know it's going to disenfranchise this many black people, but only this many white people. Therefore, you'll get the advantage, and hopefully you'll see that this where we that black people have good faith, and we just believe you, you, if you guys want to do this, you'll stop terrorizing us. <laughs> Sir, that's not how this works. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I, you have good attention. That's not how this works. Um, so, I, you know, I just see things repeat themselves, and so I try to make those connections in the writing. So one of the things I see happening is around the use of language and how so many uh, terms that we thought meant one thing now mean something else. And there was a particular article I was reading over the weekend uh, where you talk about, speaking of Arizona, uh, uh, Carrie Lake and Tulsi Gabbard and how they've actually taken some of the languaging and philosophy of Dr. King and actually turned it on its head using some of the same phraseology, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that. First. Well, you could say this started with Reagan, right? The, 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 yeah. the Republicans started to co-opt civil rights language, mm. uh, but you know, basically, since the civil rights movement, they started to co-opt civil rights language because a a, a tactic that has existed even longer than the co-option of the language has been the kind of looking glass sensibility around racial oppression. A lot of uh, racial extremists will simply say to white people, you are now the discriminated class, right? And so when they say this over and over and over, it's you being discriminated against. Oh, you're not getting into college because it's saving seats for somebody else. Oh, you're not getting a job because it's affirmative action and it's quotas. Oh, you're not getting, you know, forget about the fact that you used to have like 70, 80% of the seats. And you're, the fact that you don't have the other 20 is a problem, right? So, um, so once you have turned it the other way around and you convince people that they are in fact oppressed, oppressed yes. then the, ra- the, the civil rights language makes complete sense for them to use. And so they co-opt all the time. Mm. They're constantly talking about MLK. DeSantis was literally quoting Martin Luther King, and he's he's writing a bill to to uh, uh, he's signing a bill to prevent the accurate teaching of Black history. I mean, like, but 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 that is not disconnected to them. Like that all makes complete sense to these people, and you know they have come to the at least at least the kind of rhetorical conclusion that the only, only racists are the people who talk about race. Mm. <laughs> so, like, if I say racism is a problem, I say, ha, huh, you're a racist because you said race. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Yeah, it is. It is. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, let's see. What am I getting here in terms of questions? I just got the app. Just downloaded the app. We got the text message. Okay, good. <laughs> They're still trying to get to the app. Right? Is that what's happening? Okay. All right. So um, I want to then shift the conversation a little bit to talk about um, uh, the recent opera that was done based on your book. Uh, Terrence okay. Blanchard. <laughs> I'm just shift this just for a moment while they get their questions. <laughs> okay. So Terrence Blanchard is the artistic director of jazz uh, at the symphony. Oh, thank you. There they are. Ooh. <laughs> See, I was sitting there going, y'all ain't going to ask no questions? And now I got 40 questions. Okay. But anyway, I did want to talk a little bit about how that came about. Uh, how you, oh. you know, Terrence, did, did he approach you? Or did you how, uh, the director, the artistic director of the St. Louis Opera, okay. which had uh, commissioned Terrence to do another opera in jazz called Champion mm-hmm. a, a few years before. Uh, Wanted him to do another opera. Uh, as Terrence tells it, his wife had read my first book. Robin. She, yeah. Robin had yeah. read it, and she liked it, told him to read it. He read it. He thought, oh, could this could be the thing we do if they wanted me to do another opera. So the, the artist director contacted me, let me know that Terrence was interested. They set up a lunch to make sure we got along. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we did, of course. We were both from Louisiana. Like, we just, you know, yeah, it was, it was fun. 
Uh, and they, I mean, it is it is their work. I mean, it is it is another thing. Genre, yeah. It, it holds genre. The you know, uh, it's a different piece of art, yeah. but it is inspired by my book. My book. And um, and it's it's a amazing. They did piece. an amazing job. Yeah. They really did. Uh, I actually wanted to acknowledge Sue Wayne Brown is here for the Detroit Opera. Thank you for joining us, Ryan. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I want to. I want to hear the question you just laughed at. It's a, I don't want to say I laughed at it then right after and next day, but it might be somebody's question. Thank you, my dear. Uh, I will need those. So it's uh, it said, who is Jim Crow and where is he buried? So, uh, it's an interesting question. Actually. No, it's not. It's Jim Crow. I, I'm not even going to get into this because I can't remember it right now because I'm getting old and I have senior moments. But it was, <laughs> it was actually I think a vaudeville character born in the north, and that and and they simply used that name to apply to what was happening in the south. But it's you know it was a, it's another phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so how do we re-engage when so much time has elapsed and the attention seems to decrease and the activists have scattered? Where do we start? So I assume that that means Black Lives Matter. Yeah. All right. Partially. So um, a lot of people had cabin fever during the during COVID. And they couldn't go outside, but you could go outside if you wanted to protest. So they did. And Millions of people did. And they had been inside so long that they watched news in a way that nobody did. And so basically, we had a cabin fever episode of racial justice. Everybody was in on it. Everybody put up uh, a Black Lives Matter sign on their door like it was, you know, the, the lamb's blood to make sure that, <laughs> that it didn't take their first lesson. Right? So everybody did it. And then the mask came off, and we got the shot, and everybody came back outside. And it was like, oh, that was crazy, that thing we did, right? Uh, and they let it go. And in fact, not just let it go, completely reversed. Uh, there's some things that got into the political stream that are, hard, that, that are long-term things that were hard to take out, right? So movement on... Uh, just taking down monuments. It got put into the system. It, it was going to take a long time anyway, so it, they, they still happened. Uh, some institutes that were established right after still exist. Some promises for institutes, they didn't get, it happened in time enough? Next. Uh, the states that moved to change their criminal code, New York, California, the ones that did it in the first year right after, it happened. Right now, Mm. Not gonna happen. Not happen. Uh, corporations promised billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Most of that money never materialized, and we got to a position where you can't say the word woke anymore, and very few people on the news say the phrase "Black Lives Matter." It just vanished. Mm. Vanished. Um, and even, and we have like all these black mayors now of these major cities, uh, New York and, uh, Louisiana. San Francisco, LA, Chicago. Chicago, and almost all of them had to run on a platform of increasing police funding. All of them. So... You, you're, we're existing in a backlash phase. This is not uncommon. The, 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 this is what this is how you got Jim Crow. There was massive black progress during Reconstruction. You know, you got your first two black senators, both from Mississippi. Mississippi was the, like the black power capital of the country. Like you can't be, you can't believe it now, but people black the, the smart black people are moving to Mississippi. Like there's gonna be power down there. Right, 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 yeah. right. So and when that and what, what what basically happened was two things. 
White liberals got tired. They do. And then they found other things they said were more pressing. That a recession was, uh, economic anxiety, a recession was coming. They got tired of the agitation and having to defend the South. And then you had a contested presidential election between the liberals and the conservatives. And basically the conservatives said, okay, fine, we'll give you the presidency. But one of the things you have to do is remove all these troops from the South and the troops were the people who were protecting the black people to keeping them from the racial violence. They weren't completely successful in all the cases. There was still a lot of racial violence, but it, there was some guard against it. But everybody knew what that meant. The moment you remove those troops, bedlam, right? And so the liberal allies of the North made the decision that they were giving up. And we see a lot of that happening again. The presidential election is too important for us to keep using the word, uh, uh, you know, defund the police. Okay, what you call it, but reorganize that, figure that out. You know, what I, call it what you want to call it. They couldn't even say it anymore. They they were so afraid of losing a presidential election. I don't even, you know, there was uh, economic anxiety and and. A fear of recession still is because of what happened during COVID. Uh, they, there was some uptick in crime, nothing like this panic that people have going on about crime, but that was another way to, to substitute race into, the, into politics without saying the word race. And so kind of the same dynamics of backlash and giving up happened in the wake of Black Lives Matter that happened in the wake of Reconstruction. Right. So having been born and raised in the Deep South and knowing the pervasiveness of racism across the nation, do you believe that your children still benefited more from their life in New York City versus the one in your home state? Well, this is a great question. They talk more eloquently about this than I do. Um, I, I prefer to focus on my life, which it was spent like half, the first half was in Louisiana, second in New York, the last three years I've been back in Atlanta. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of money in big liberal cities. And people believe, and maybe you can make an argument for this, that, that just by osmosis, you gain something culturally from being around that much money. Because what that money does, no matter how it's earned, a lot of places earned in really horrible, horrible ways, a lot of dirty hands, a lot of bloody hands on, on a lot of green money. Uh, but they give to cultural institutions. So you, in the big cities, you have a lot of cultural institutions that benefit from very rich people, some of whom nobody should be that rich, and you had to do something crazy to get that kind of money, but they benefit from it. So you have bigger museums, you have more plays, you have more shows, you have all these things, cultural, that, that a child could have access to. The problem that happens with that is that, um, how much is that is about you? How much of that celebrates your culture? How much of that invites you, literally invites you in because I can walk in front of a museum, is that really an enrichment? Mm -hmm. You know? And so, and there's a difference between that and the places in America where black culture is not the spice in the city, it is the bedrock of the city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, my machine went off. Okay. <laughs> Give, well, this is a political, you probably, that's not even. <laughs> this is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask them later. Okay. This should be on, this should be right. up here. Yeah, it should be, it should be actually. Uh, because it's too much. Um, 
Why is there a way to not get 10 or... Why is there a lot of blacks who get 10 or 20 scholarships to one best college? Is there still a high dropout rate? Oh, why if black students get uh, 20 or 30 scholarships to one of some of the best colleges, is there still such a high dropout rate at universities? What do you attribute that to? You know? A black dropout rate at universities? You know, even is that true? Oh, I don't know the, I don't know the black dropout rate stats. Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, so you talk about the value of coalition building across populations of, uh, versus attempting to reconcile with folks in denial or hate. Can you talk about the value of coalition building right. across populations? I assume that means races. Right. I, I'm assuming that means race, uh, sexuality, gender, all sorts yeah. of things. Um, you know, this this has been the question, which is whether or not uh, and to what degree people can be allied. And the the misnomer in this has been that it is some sort of binary. It is white, non-white. But there are a lot of differences among people who are not white, right? So, you know, there's a reason, whatever it is, that a third of Hispanics and Asians vote Republican and only 10% of black people do, right? The, the, the alignments are not perfect. These are completely different cultures. Even within the Hispanic communities in America, coming from vastly different, you know, uh, uh, cultural perspectives. Uh, and the black population in America increasingly coming from vastly different perspectives and cultures as the percentage of African immigrants increases dramatically in this country. They have no relationship to the legacy of American slavery. Many of them uh, benefit from... Uh, uh, or a talent visas or lottery, the lottery system. And, you know, a, a, the talent visa pool of people, that's a whole different idea, right? So there's, you're, this, you're creaming the, the, the world. You're just taking the best of the best of the best. It's a whole different concept of, you know, how that group of people will think. And, uh, you know, if you take the, Asian population of America, the majority of them come after the Immigration Act of 65. So majority are, you know, or a large percentage are part of a, a talent in immigration. That's a whole different concept of a population group. The, the white population of America in the beginning was a mix some people who they were kicking out of England as, uh, as some people who were coming to try to get rich in a, a new frontier area. So you had a very mixed situation. Uh, the African population uh, of America was, you know, anyone who could be captured and sold. It was not a choice. Uh, you know, so the, the population, how a population begins in the country informs a lot about how they feel about the country. And when they arrive in the country, whether it's be, if you're arriving after 65, you're benefiting from civil rights movement, but you don't have no relationship to it. So all you know is a America that, that, that doesn't have sanctioned slavery, that doesn't have a sanctioned Jim Crow. You have, you know, uh, Beatles America. So, uh, so all of that's very different. And so I think when we talk about allyship, it's a much more complicated uh, a conversation because just because you may have, that white supremacy may have negatively impacted you doesn't mean you have all the same values and value the same things. And a person who is oppressed on one end can be oppressive on another. Right? Uh, and that's a real problem. You know, that we, we have to recognize more. You can be 
oppressed and privileged. I can be oppressed as a black man and privileged as a man to a woman in society. And be unaware, only worrying about how I'm oppressed, not even factoring in that I have privilege over this other person. And that's how complicated allyship becomes when you really get into the weeds of it. So do you believe that history is repeating itself? Are we doomed to a permanent underclass as black and brown people, or is there a way to break that cycle? And if so, how? Oh, sorry. So is history repeating itself? Or are we doomed? Are we doomed to a permanent underclass as black and brown people? Or is there a way to break that cycle? And if so, how? It, nothing. Nothing is doomed to permanence. Um, uh, we created race, you know, yeah, right. about three hundred years ago. Uh, it, it didn't even exist right. the way we define it. Not even a concept. It, it wasn't even a concept. Yeah. Right. You know, like race was a word that was used kind of culturally, tribally, and it was like one group of people in North, uh, uh, in Western Europe was fighting another group. They were basically another race of people, you know what I mean? But it wasn't, it wasn't your physical appearance wasn't the determination of what we call race. So we created this thing. So anything that can be created can be undone. The problem we have in America is that we've built so many of our uh, institutions on the exploitation of the concept of race, mm. right? So every time, you know, we, we benefited financially in addition to culturally. If you were taxing everybody in the city at the same rate, but you were giving the most of the money over here and, and denying these people, you're benefiting financially from the system of race, and that becomes a real problem. And, and that's what I think we see a lot in our politics. America made a basic promise to white people that it did not make to, any, to, to other people. If you worked hard and you stayed out of trouble, we'll pretty much guarantee that you'll have some level of safety and security. That wasn't a promise that anybody else got. And America did a lot to subsidize that. People f- freak out about handouts. Now, America's been giving out handouts to white people forever. You know, like, it was just, it was, it was just the way people thought government worked. You know, it, it, when King was talking about all this free land, it, it was a thing. But America gave that away. That's so why I was I'm always like, when they are protesting in the West, and you can't take my land, and but we've been here for so many, I'm like, yeah, but a lot of that land was good. <laughs> like, it's just, it's tricky, right? Um, but, not, but, but as King said in another speech, it wasn't just that they gave the land. They then created land-grant colleges to teach them how to farm. They did out, sent out county inspectors to improve their farm. They gave them low interest rate loans so they could mechanize the farms. And then they create a subsidy so they didn't even have to farm. <laughs> and then these became some of the same people that looked at the black people and said, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstrap. And it's like, what? <laughs> so it can be done, but in the same way, that the government always seems to invest in industry when it is white dominated. And that could be uh, Silicon Valley, that can be new marijuana uh, uh, facilities, everything, like when it's white dominated, everybody's giving money like crazy. So the idea of helping literally economically, and this, this could be folded into the reparations discussion, Literally helping economically to make to ensure to, to as King said to put in a floor from which you can build is something that America has been in the business of doing the entire history of the country. The question becomes whether or not 
America will continue to chafe at the idea of doing that for people who are not white. So sort of a related question regarding the costly policies it will take to dismantle the result of what they're calling free policies. How can policymakers in Detroit elevate reparations or restorative justice policies while there are other quality of life issues to address citywide, demanding funding as well? So I don't understand city reparations as much as I understand national reparations because particularly in a majority black city, so what you know, take the money from some black people, give it to other black people, that's not exactly how the reparations is supposed to work. You know, like, because if the tax base is 80% black people, that's my money. Like, you can't repair me with my own money. <laughs> so I don't understand it as well, and I'm sure there are activists who deal with the reparation on a local level who can probably explain it to me better. I understand it more as a national issue and also because the price tag is enormous. And only on a national level could you truly deal with it. I think you. I think there is there is some virtue in wanting to get right with people on a local level, uh, and there may be some price tag associated with that. Uh, but the actual discussion of reparations is truly a national one. And so, where am I? To my okay. One well, probably last question. How? Uh, Heather McGee, McGee right, yes. references the economic costs of racism and how it affects all populations. What do you believe is the best way for us to educate uh, both ourselves and the masses about this work on abolishing structural racism and economic racism? Well, I think you have to start with, the, with this understanding. It's not about education. It's not, this, this didn't happen in the dark, in secret room, when nobody knew. It happened in the public, out in the open. People know it's, the, it's you. I think we, and I, writers in particular, we believe that like some, if I just explain it better, <laughs> if, if I just have a different, better phrase, then they'll get it and it'll change. No, it's not about, you can't educate your way out of this because it's not because people don't know. They do know. They do know, and they do it in spite of that. Right? It, what he, you know, Heather in her book uses this brilliant analogy about it costing everybody about the filling in of the swimming pools. They were required to integrate public. You know, the uh, the end of Jim Crow required these cities to allow black people to swim in swimming pools with white people, and rather than do that. They filled them in, which meant that nobody had the right. Had so then you had all these private swimming clubs popped up, and now you had to pay for the thing that you used to get the, for free, but they'd rather do that than swim with you. That's not an, edu that's not an educational issue. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.